been prouder to stand against the extractive neocolonialism that is perpetuated by the IMF when they put art, like, on arbitrary and destructive terms on countries that are in the midst of development that immensely need our help, that is a significant principle win, so proud to take it. So, in session, uh, why do we think that there are incentives to uh, do policies that are done, sorry, why do we think there are good political incentives for countries to put policies in place when they are not imposed by the IMF? Firstly, we think that a lot of developing countries are to some extent democratic and often their democracy, uh, you know, democratic success is strongly predicated on economic success. But even if you don't think they're democratically successful, a lot of authoritarian leaders stay in power because of economic success they can bring to their country. And thirdly, because we don't think that the most rogue states are likely to be getting loans from the IMF, we think they're often embargoed and sanctioned. What this means is that we think that even if uh, the IMF doesn't impose loan conditions that may sometimes be favourable for these countries, the countries are likely to do it themselves. But the harm that we avoid is having incredibly bad loan, to, uh, loan conditions imposed on these countries. The point of all of this is that even if you believe that these countries are likely to suffer from elite capture, they will basically benefit from the country doing well, and we're still very happy to stand the act for our anti-corruption. That's an incredibly important uh, impact in this debate. Happy to take closing if they have a POI. If countries can implement good economic policy anyway, why do they oftentimes need an injection of capital? Uh, I think that there's a very large number of reasons that that's true. I think like extractive colonialism has often destabilized these countries. In, uh, intervention by Western powers has often destabilized these countries. But also like everyone needs injections of capital. I think the fact that you put uh, economic terms on those things doesn't like reveal anything about the nature of these countries. Like I've just spent a minute saying, they're probably going to do policies that are good their own economic incentives. The thing that happens on our side is that Western countries aren't able to bully them and pressure them and threaten them with starvation if they don't put in pro-Western policies. So, principally, why do we think these conditions are so wrong? We think it's firstly incredibly coercive. Sure. So, just to be clear, if you don't support our conditions, what types of conditions, if you have any conditions whatsoever, will you support on your side? Sure. We're happy to support things like not saying you can't run a budget deficit or a democracy, so people being able to choose the conditions they support. We think the thing is that countries are different, that they won't always benefit from the same sets of conditions. We think the best people to decide those are like the economists employed by governments in those countries and things like that. Firstly, we think it is highly coercive to opt into these loans. That is, these countries need the money desperately. They often have millions of people languishing without economic development. And so they're willing to make sacrifices that are principled and political in order to get them. Secondly, we think that this are, you know, the end point of this is that they lose a significant amount of autonomy by taking these loans. But secondly, we think that it is a principled wrong, in fact, for the IMF to offer or to coerce countries into these conditions. That is firstly because it is not done with the best interests of these countries at heart. I think there is a significant difference between you know, economic white papers and things like that and saying you cannot have a loan unless you put a structural adjustment program in place. We're saying you cannot have a loan if you're willing to run budget deficits or have high uh, way, you know, high minimum wages and things like that. But secondly, because there is a significant, a significant amount of uh, historical evidence that these policies are bad and people continue to persist with them. That is, pro-market policies that have been forced upon countries like India by the IMF uh, have been incredibly harmful uh, in the past. We think that they perpetuate some of the worst ills in the <coughs> injustices of colonialism. But thirdly, we think that to the extent that you could be, uh, that you could perhaps buy it, that you know, it is a good thing to offer a loan and, you know, there should be some kind of reciprocal give and take. We think that this is not justified. Firstly, we think that there is a huge amount of suffering within these countries and so there is probably, a, well, there is a moral obligation to uh, offer, you know, to give them ways to get out of this, to help them, without imposing extractive conditions. No, thank you. Secondly, we think that this harm is often caused by people who back the IMF or was historically caused by them. And so we think that there probably isn't an obligation to accept, you know, damaging terms when you probably were put in the very, like, the very position by countries like England or uh, by countries like the US. But the third thing is that we think that the harm that it causes these countries is disproportionate uh, and incredibly wrong compared to the, you know, benefit that it might be reasonable for, um, or like the IMF or IMF backers to receive. We think, again, there can be other mutually beneficial policies, and those are things we're happy to support. But we think that the best people to make decisions about a country's economic future are the people who vote for it, uh, and that's something that we're incredibly proud to stand behind. But the second thing is, uh, in this speech, that the terms are likely to be incredibly harmful, no thank you, uh, and damage, damaging to the fate of the development of these countries and to the citizens within them. Firstly, why do we think these terms are going to be very bad? Uh, by way of example, I point to the, structure, the impact of structural adjustment programs uh, in India. The fact that pushing free market rules on a country that was in a nascent stage of development has caused huge harms. Arguably, India has like missed the bus of regional development to a significant extent. I think that is very 
clear problem. But some structural reasons for this. Firstly, because these policies often push a very pro-Western model of development, which I would note a lot of Western countries didn't even follow when no thank you uh, follow while they were developing. That is, they like you know they oppose things like protectionism for nascent industries or fuel subsidies, uh, which the West was very willing to do uh, while they were developing. But secondly, because trade is a zero-sum game, and often these countries have an active uh, the countries that back the IMF have an active incentive to do things that are incredibly harmful. What does this look like? Making things that are highly like advantageous to incredibly wealthy countries who are able to buy cheap exports um, from uh, from these countries while they're in the midst of their development. Yeah. What are your structural reasons as to why a nation in Eastern Europe, a Southern America, Southeast Asia knows what is best for its economic development? Uh, firstly, I think that there are universities in these countries. Secondly, I think that they have uh, the capacity to employ a large number of economists. Thirdly, I think that there's incentives for people uh, within bodies like the UN or even the IMF to provide economic advice and countries are able to take it. But I think that this economic advice should be economic coercion and I think that it's incredibly important. Thanks guys. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that we allow people to make decisions. Because I think that even if it is, you know, by some free market version of economics, better to have really low minimum wages. When people are voting on the fact that they no longer can afford to eat because they have such low wages that are so incredibly good for, you know, people making investments in their country, that is really harmful. Because trade is so is such a zero sum game and uh, there are so many benefits to being extractive. I think these policies are often, you know, able to take uh, to capitalize on the coercion that is inherent in the fact that some countries are incredibly wealthy and other countries have been consistently uh, marginalized and ex extensively harmed by uh, the system of capitalism that currently exists. I think this is like incredibly important, uh, an incredibly important impact in this debate because I think, panel, that as Eleanor is going to explain to you, we're very likely to still get loans. I think they are politically popular within countries to do foreign aid. I think there's a lot of value to it. We can still get mutually beneficial things if people, for example, vote for a free trade deal. But on side opening government, we don't stand for any incredibly harmful, malicious uh, imposition of these terms. So incredibly proud to oppose. So proud to be from Melbourne. and sharing adequate pieces of this sort of case. Why is this a likely characterization? Number one, you don't want to be seen as bullies because this is directly influenced in media by the countries who fund this particular fund in the West, who will portray a narrative that they are bankrupt in these countries, they are strong arm in them, and all because of all the rhetoric that you hear from this Australian team right here, this is the, and these people are, how to say, very liberal, they are middle class, they care about these particular issues, they don't necessarily pressure their government. Now, because the federal government doesn't want, uh, how to say, scandal on their hands, they are necessarily like to do this. But 
but second, there are just strategic reasons for you to do this. Like, number one, you most likely don't want to create huge shock into this particular economy by just imposing these conditions from tomorrow. But second, you also want these countries to cooperate with you because you have some kind of legitimacy in front of this organization. Like, each year you have to show your KPI, this is how we've been working well with these countries, this is why this is good in order to continue being, doing this particular case. Now, why absent these, uh, these policies do, uh, do countries in these regions have structural incentives to overspend? Two reasons. Firstly, they want to win elections. What are the things that they're likely to do? Number one, they like to fund state-owned workers that exist in administrations, government companies in this particular case. Because these are people whose employment is directly connected with the ruling party right now. It's the surest way for you to guarantee democratic elections and today they vote to you when you know that the money in your hat is coming from the uh, 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 ruling party in this particular case. But secondly, they're likely to fund pointless processes, building a road to nowhere, being a, building a highway to nowhere, building a port that there isn't a ship there. Or let's be nuanced here. Not that, not that extent of these things are that important, right? Like not that, that, that percent of, how do you say, uh, of, of ships are in this port in this particular case. Or just funding, how do you say, uh, companies that aren't necessarily important, like carpentry industry in this particular case, mining industry, even though it's not strategic. Because this is the way that you buy out people who are ready to say, ah, yes, the government this this particular thing, I will vote for this person. But thirdly, straight corruption in this particular case. And I know their side says that they keep corruption, but here is the comparative. IMF is impossible to control corruption 100% and so far as they're expanding government spending, so they're expanding different streams of money going into the economy, it's far easier for you as a to give money to people that are very closely close to you, people that you will be loyal to you in this particular case. But secondly, voters in these regions aren't the most educated ones and aren't the most adequate ones. For the structural reasons, the opening government gives you all the processes that you have, colonialism, communists running your country for 50 years in this particular case, lack of money, all of these things means that you don't necessarily think critically in this particular case, but secondly, democracy in many of these countries has existed very, very rarely, so there aren't accountability checks, there aren't institutions. <laughs> Why is this argument important? Because you're likely to vote for pro-left communist party that comes into this power or the majority of political parties to be left-leaning in this particular case and to have a coalition between center-left and far-left that necessarily because they want to, how do you say, give promises back to their people, they do this. This is comparatively better on our side house because they can always say, oh no, I am left tiger hands, we can't do it, guys. This is the problem in this particular case. I will necessarily explain to you why this leads to more growth that will mean that these countries are better able to pay off their loans in the future and stop the rate But for that, CG, because... Yes. The economy is a big, the most important voting issue. If it gets worse on your side, why wouldn't people vote the people in power out? But look, the vo you vote the people in power out. But then the, dam the damage is already done, firstly. But secondly, because I proved you structure, these people aren't the most educated. They're likely to be profited by future policies. And secondly, you forget that the future, uh, that the crisis happened, right? In 10 years time, when there's future crisis, you forget this particular case, because new political actors is coming to power, you vote for communists again in this particular case. Why is this necessary for more growth? Now, let's uh, uh, engage with all of the things that are info side, because panel did a very bad job. Firstly, interest rates. When interest rates are low, you're, able, you're better able to get cheap loans that are directly used in the economy. This means that, for example, businesses can take out loans in order to start this particular business. Or consumers can take out loans and they can buy more stuff because the price on the loan is lower. This means that you're better able to increase, uh, how do you say, the total money circulation in the economy. But secondly, when you're, if you're an export-based economy, and structurally most of these countries are export-based because they have cheap labor, because they don't have tertiary sectors, because the people aren't that educated in this particular case, and there aren't strong labor regulations, so the currency is lower because of, because of the interest is because the, how do you say, the loans are cheap and there's multiple circulating currency in the economy, they're better able to export more because the, how do you say, the ratio of Western currency to this currency is decreased. But secondly, straight up currency and change. Many of these countries may do things like, for example, uh, how do you say, deposit policies where they mandate currency to exist in their economy, or secondly, to how do you say, uh, increase the ratio of their currency to the other side's currency, which necessarily means that you have less capacity as business to come in and set up, less capacity as business to operate in this particular case because you're doing this sort of thing. And thirdly, on the fertilizer thing, look. I'm not sure if this is fertilized with fuels. I view this as general monopoly argument, right? So Wait, country X has incentive to invest in certain sectors where they have like close people with political ties with them, or obviously they create their own voters because these are corporate votes that they can lose later. I think it's, it depends to less than just fertilize in this particular case. But when you create artificial monopolies by spending money in these sort of things, when, they, when these companies are already mandated, they're receiving money from the government, either direct, direct 
cash and capital this particular SBS subsidies, they're able to create artificial market situation. There isn't any competition. When Gazprom is the only competition in this particular case, US other energy companies have no way to deal with them because they can price you out in these types of cases, because they've gotten the most educated workers with you in this particular case. All of these reasons and all these processes mean that growth increases, jobs are increased, people grow money over time in this particular case. And note, we don't have to be scandals. When inflation prices hit, or we'll increase interest rates to combat. Because everyone else around the world is also doing this. West, Eastern Europe, it doesn't matter. Everyone is doing this in particular. So this is likely to be done sensible, right, in this particular case. This means that you have less spending done by the government and more capacity for the government to pay out. So you get added benefit of job being created, but government is also better able to, uh, to tell you not spend this money. This is important because governments will likely to work with the IMF on both sides of the house because they like their loans. But when they're not able to pay, that's when they cut health care. That's when they cut other things that are important in this particular case. Uh, like I would say, uh, expanding the, uh, like, expanding health care, expanding education, expanding all these type of things. That's when government goes into crisis. For all these reasons, please oppose this motion. <laughs> of opposition for a fine speech and call upon the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the case of the top end. Wanted to trade with them, wanted to benefit from the sorts of materials that were coming out of these countries, the 
manufacturing they did. That was much harder to benefit from at the point at which people do not have the money, governments do not have the money to function. But then thirdly, we thought that there was international regions of reasons why different countries wanted to be perceived as good actors. That looked like things like China and the US both wanting to be seen as helping to, uh, in order to have the most in, uh, international influence. But there were also just states that were generally considered to be pretty good actors uh, that gave away much more money than others. Uh, some of the Scandinavian states come to mind. All right, at that point, it's pretty clear that there's still going to be money right. given on our side. The issue here now is whether or not it's used in a better way, with or without uh, structural reasons. So let's note here that the first thing they tell you is that, oh, obviously, uh, they're not going to make good decisions if we don't impose on them a way to make decisions. First thing that's uh, contingent on them proving that these like, uh, restrictions are going to be good, I'm going to deal with that later. But secondly, I think that the reason why they're still likely to have good decisions being made, aside from that stuff about like, oh, like, you know, there's not enough people to make them, obviously the, there is a symmetric incentive from the IMF on both sides to do things like provide, um, you know, uh, advice, to provide people that they can consult with. Perhaps in fact there's more incentive to do things like provide economists on our side of the house, because you cannot simply say, do it like this. You actually have to say, here are the reasons why this might be good. Here are the reasons why you could Here's how you can put this into place. That applied because they wanted to obviously still get certain returns, they still had certain views, but now you have the choice whether or not you wanted to buy into this. Obviously, we tell you at Live, there are reasons why you want your country to do well economically. Even if you believe that you're an authoritarian regime, often you're premised on how well economically you did in order to have the consent that meant that people did not um, like protest all the time to knock down your regime. But I'm going to provide a new map here as well. But note that like, you are now more likely to have the IMF do things like check up on your progress. Because rather than just saying, here are the conditions, meet it, and then dump you with it, there was more of a um, incentive to make sure there is some level of transparency. What's happening with this money? Why is it going? And to continue to have things that were going to help that country to use it to the best of their own ability. The next thing they tell me is that they, uh, when we put these in place, you stop excessive <coughs> overspending, and then you might want to you know, put this money into like, you know, who knows what bad things that people don't like. Firstly, all the things they tell you are harms, I'm pretty much willing to cover good because they're spending generally on the people. Let's consider <coughs> where the money is likely to be pulled out of at the point at which you cut spending. Because it wasn't going to be pulled out of mining. It wasn't going to be pulled out of things that were politi politically palatable and had masses of lobbying power behind them. It was going to be pulled out of things like welfare, like education, like rural stimulus programs that there was no political incentive to fund at the point at which you do not have the excess money to do so. Note then that all sorts of harms they want to tell you about excess overspending probably apply the most on their side because they're now under pressure to keep those companies, they keep those corporate interests on side when they do not have the same level of control, when they do not have the same level of money to spend on things. That was the point at which you are more likely to exacerbate that harm because you funnel the money into the people who need it, need it the oh, most, exactly. uh, need it the least, and you, you take it away from the people who need it the most closing. If you believe in the principled right to borrow however much money you want, why do you have some constraints like anti corruption We don't believe in the principled right to borrow as much money as you want. We believe that these country have been fucked over by colonialism. No, anti corruption is separate to this. That was because it meant that the money went to the people in the country. We cared principally about the people within the country more so than we cared about the governors. That was to ensure that that money got there, which is why it stood outside of the principle. But then lastly, um, uh, they tell you that this is going to be really good uh, conditions because like, they're going to be put in place firstly step by step. Note that that exacerbates the principle's harm, right? At the point at which you opt into a loan not knowing what the conditions are going to be in the long run because you had no choice, that is when you lose the last remnants of your autonomy. But no, secondly, that also just like doesn't show it's going to be good. We tell you that there are economic incentives for the places like the IMF to impose loans that are favourable to the West. But secondly, also, note that they often these institutions simply did not understand what was going to be best for these countries because they did not have the same experience of knowing, you know, what the conditions were like. It often came from a lack of information that came from arrogance looking out from the West in and imposing things that were not applicable inside. They lastly tell you then that there's going to be less investment because you see with the bad policy. Um, I'm sorry, but firstly, obviously, like, there is still investment in all sorts of countries, especially at the point at which China is decoupling, uh, China and the US are decoupling. They have to go into these other countries. That increases it. But empirically, it's simply not true. We've seen heaps of investment in South Korea and Taiwan, which have not had these same regulations imposed by the IMF, because we got you the best outcomes, and the principally and practically we're so proud to propose. <laughs>
firstly on the nature of the loans. I think we provided just three reasons as to why it's very likely that these economies currently are export economies and why the specific factors in the nature of why the particular conditions are actually very beneficial for these particular economies, especially in the long term when you gain the ability to diversify these economies, but also make sure that you have stable growth within the short term and middle term while building out this particular new diversification. So why is this nature going to be fairly okay? I think there are two main responses here. Firstly, in specific cases that there's obviously like, because if we have to kind of talk about multiple economies, right? In specific cases where a particular condition is extremely bad, especially in the short term, you still have the ability and the incentives, which I'm going to prove, to make sure that uh, this doesn't hit you that much. E.g., for example, when the European Union implemented embargo on Russian oil, it did not implement it right away for particular yeah, countries that were over dependent on it. For example, the Russian embargo for uh, Bulgaria, yeah. Romania, and many of these countries was made uh, as a condition after 2024, giving them enough time to basically <laughs> recoup and make sure that they make different sources, so that the prices of this particular oil did not hit directly the consumers in these particular countries. So the question is, you obviously can do these things, why do you have the incentive as the IMF to do these particular things? Obviously, in the long term in these countries, are uh, seen as long-term investments, as opening their markets and things like that. And obviously the IMF is mostly like the money of Western countries who already have opened up and have market economies and would like their businesses to have access to the consumers in these places, but also make sure that these places produce good and effective uh, stuff for them. Meaning that you have an incentive as an, uh, an IMF in these countries to, uh, to do it in the right way, to have a good idea and to, uh, to basically have good image in front of this particular developing uh, countries and uh, also uh, make sure that like you're out competing China in the presence uh, 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 in presence with this particular country meaning that you're likely to make this consensus when it matters the most not only in terms of timing but when for example when uh, 2020 hit IMF restructured the loans for many of uh, this particular country they can restructure the timing uh, even in the worst case scenario they can remove the condition but let's say they never remove the condition I think they can definitely and make it so the country can actually do it well. Why is it important to draw? It means that all of the short term harms to these particular economies and countries that they can particularly claim are likely to happen. Meaning that all the long term things that we talk in terms of yeah, stable yeah. growth and how this economy shift into better place are much, uh, much more important. But second of all, in the short term, when you know that these are long term conditions, you as an investor that directly puts money into business and things like that. When you know that they are likely to have stronger currency in the future, when you know that they are likely to have more uh, uh, good like inter interest rates and things like that, you are far more likely to go into these countries yeah. in, the, in the first place and invest right now, right away. But also, because of all the structural reasons of overspending that Truman gave you, it means that in the, uh, in the you are basically preferred to handle future crises that come to you, which is extremely, uh, extremely important. Because look, you can help people with welfare right now, but I, I'm not sure if you have the political capital for welfare in these countries, why you wouldn't do it on both sides of the house. It's good to spend. Governments have the incentive to spend on both sides of the house. We agree with them. The problem is when they overspend and they're not prepared for the next four years. And even if a new government comes, they still have the same incentives that we have outlined. They're still going to overspend in order to ca capture the vote, make sure that they're the new big party and things like that. Oh, this is an external factor, an over overwatch eye that sends a signals to investors that no matter what the government, these conditions will be met and this overspending will not happen. Uh, <coughs> Life is important because in the context of crisis, Interest rates, uh, interest rates are going to like you're basically when you don't have the money, you're going to be late on payments uh, uh, in, in your current uh, in your current loans because every country takes loans. It means that you uh, you uh, uh, basically your interest is, uh, interest rate is going to increase even more. You uh, you have uh, uh, it's gonna like in certain cases you can even like uh, it damage your. Of currency directly, like what happens with the bank freezes in uh, in Greece when uh, when they defaulted on their loans, 
or even like worse uh, policies that you have to do, uh, is especially okay. restrict spending even more in these conditions because you know that uh, that you need to pay up those loans okay. or you are essentially defaulting the current currency. This is when the vulnerable groups are going to be hit the most. This is when their lack of political capital is the most important in this particular round before I continue closing. Your reasons about why this policy will be done good mitigate your benefit because if you care so much to not angry those countries, you will not be as harsh, thus you cannot receive your benefits that much on your side of the house. Don't squirrel. No, 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 no. We can, we can say that the IMF is not stupid, this is not squirreling the debate. I give you ability and incentive in these part, uh, par, uh, par, particular, uh, particular cases. So, uh, on that sense, I think also in the very long term, by the, the growth in these economies, it empowers individuals and all. A lot of the policies that are in the conditions that we talked about are meaning that you have more FDI. It means more competitions between international investors in your country, which means better working conditions, better options to work in general, better payment, better less ability for monopolizations of markets, which on its own is ext extremely, uh, extremely problematic. It means that a lot of these people, uh, regardless of what is their class and social status, are likely to gain access to these things and the incentives in this case align greatly for our, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for our, for our side uh, of the house. I think another, another form of way that I would like to say, in the future you have more bargaining power. If you have already opened up your economies and they are stronger and they are seen as long-term growth economies and you have different investors and partners in your country, you can choose should I go to China, should I go to the, should, should I go to the IMF, but you can only have the bargaining power against China not fucking you over with bad loans and bad conditions if you are seen as a good developing economy uh, in the first place. Finally, on the principle, I think you already know it's complete bullshit. But I think that you cannot uphold your principal right to help these people or let them choose if they are forced to live in conditions uh, and actually protect them against their own government incentive, which we do much better on our side of the house. And honestly, I don't care if we give them jobs, opportunities, and we make sure that their countries protect them for future things. Because when the economy hits, this is when they're going to lose their jobs, factories are going to be closed, and never be fucking proud of your boss.
Sure, they want to be re-elected, but parties want to be re-elected 10 times over, over, the, over the next 50 years, which means they have a pragmatic long-term incentive to actively ensure that they don't do the most scandalous and corrupting po co like short-termist economic policies. But I would say that third, let's consider the opening opposition. Many of those places are corrupt, don't have democratic institutions, they are purely te technocratic, right? If this is the case, then people are content with the status quo, that is to say, actively being oppressed, and not having individual rights because they make the trade of the current peace, providing to them economical stability over the long term, which presumes that if you take them at their very best, most countries are, have adequate economical policies or they're not doing the most scandalous things. No. Now, why are those countries not going to take the loans if those conditions exist? And I want to be very specific about the motion and tie to the specific conditions that were given by the motion. First, in the vast majority of cases, it is, it is literally unfeasible for them to do so. Not all countries are doing those specific conditions, conditions there are specific case, sub cases in which they are doing it. This is true for two reasons. Like, firstly, countries in general are very risk averse towards doing anti market policies, because this is a dominant ideology in the vast majority of in the vast majority of the world. The financial experts are actively propagating that you shouldn't be doing subsidies, rent caps, and all the stuff like that. But secondly, I would say that in many cases, there is a massive amount of private lobbying which actively pushes countries to be pro market, which necessarily means, even if in spite of all those pressures, they are still relying on such programs, this necessarily means that it's a necessity. This is a necessity because, firstly, in terms of purely pure context about what is happening in the global economy, firstly, they have to have different interest rates because there are different levels of inflation that are currently happening. That is to say, some countries are more reliant on supply chains, some countries are disproportionately more reliant on other exporters. Uh, importers that currently don't exist, but secondly, some countries, as they themselves can see, are specifically reliant on fossil fuels because they have massive results that they are actively exporting. So, uh, after the increase in the production cost, they have to subsidize them to be internationally competitive. Or, secondly, they are agricultural economies, so they need fertilizers. But Ukraine is currently in a geopolitical crisis, and they are one of the biggest importers of fertilizers, which means they have to subsidize their own industry, else they will collapse. The example of Sri Lanka. Now, why is this? Why is this important? I would say that this necessarily means that if it's an absolute necessity for them, they're not likely to take the loans. But I'm going to be very nuanced here, again, conceding to opening opposition, maybe they have some merit. In 30% of the cases, they're prone to populism. Why does this mean specifically that they're not going to be taking the loans? I think there are multiple reasons as to why it's going to be politically popular. I would say, that firstly, considering that the IMF is predominantly seen as a Western dominated institution that has historically used austerity, exploitation, and other mechanisms of actually fucking over those nations, this necessarily means that it's politically unpopular, politically unpopular domestically, which means the opposition can actively strong in this over the short term to actively shame you for taking those specific conditions that include the human economy. I would say that, second, if they consider those are export dominated economies and many sectors are actively reliant. Actively rely on this. This best that means that there is likely get, get, like, going to be a massive package. But I would say that thirdly, in the vast majority of cases, you are seen as inconsistent. That is to say, you are changing rivers. You said that those were adequate policies that you're necessarily taking them, you're justifying yourself for a few months, and now you're reversing the course. Which necessarily means if they are short term mystic, if they are irrational in a way, and they care about getting reelected, this is massively domestic and popular. Let's now example multiple scenarios as to what happens on their side. I would say that firstly, and I know this is not the most likely case, but they don't take any loans what they don't take any loans from the IMF whatsoever. Even if the likelihood of that is low, I would say that consequences of that, considering it's an absolute necessity, is something that goes above anything else in the round, because the precondition for it to have foreign direct investment, for it to be able economically well, is for it to be able to survive. That is to say, not to get in a trap of absolute poverty, that is to say, for it to have an adequate credit score so you can get loans right. over the long run. I would say that second, and here I am going to flip over in opposition. If they have a tendency to use quantitative easing and other problematic domestic policies, if they don't have the international alternative, they're more likely to try to boost their specific economy using those specific methods, they're more likely to be populistic, irrational, and use those specific kinds of things. Before I continue, I'll take one yes. The problem is this is not a loan of one billion. It's usually a loan of the tens of billions because it's the only way to get cumulative with such currency amounts. So your whole point about them not taking the loan is wrong. Yes. You'll always take this. Yeah, that's why, why we're going to be like being rational. Yes, they're not going to be taken from the IMF, they're going to be taken from other people, right? <coughs> so private markets, private private markets that have a profit incentive, China that has geopolitical incentives to act in the US. Why is it comparatively better on our side if the option exists? Because on their side they have to actively condemn, decline, and actively signal to people that they're not going to be taking loans from the IMF. I think there are two reasons why this is the case. Firstly, on aggregate having more partners, 
that you're taking loans from, or your CPM team that you're going to be taking loans from, actively means that you are more likely to get better conditions for the loans because they're competing to give you a loan, which means now they have to offer better conditions for you to, to actively take this. But secondly, if you concede to the conditions of the IMF, and we presume that you are likely to need other loans as well, or future loans from the IMF, you are actively giving a precedent for them to acquire future loans from you. Considering that those actors are a maximally selfish actor that just wants profit out of you, and are likely to be predatory, would much rather trust the people who understand the local context in, in those domestic policies to be able to realize what is best for themselves. Which means, on their side, over the long term, because you need to take multiple loans and gigantic loans, you are less likely to be able to renegotiate with your struggling to pay, you are less likely to get lower interest rates, and thirdly, you are less likely to take future loans. So, if everything else is magical, as they can see, at least you have more partners and a better ability to have more bargaining power. Uh, oppose. <laughs> oppose. Most salient aspect of it. Why is it that harmful in opposition's work? 
and governments will. This means that there's significantly less money going into these countries. It means that it's more difficult to recover. It means that it is more difficult to pay people and make sure that they have food on the table and then do everything else. But secondly, we think that what is significantly worse on their side is that less money goes to countries that actually need it. And what happens then is that it only goes to countries that have already agreed to these policies. Why is this bad? A, you create a bias for countries that are already cozying up to the West. But secondly, you increase global inequality economically and politically. Economically, because the IMF has less money to loan to other countries, and politically, because you fracture the market or you fracture the world economy into those that are okay with free market policies and those that are not. Why is this important? I think this spins a lot of the closing government and opening government's arguments. If these clones are so important, and if they are deep necessity that they need these so that their economies still survive amidst the pandemic, they do not get these loans. Countries in Africa get, do not get these loans. Countries in Southeast Asia that do not have the capital to ensure that they can revive their manufacturing economy do not get these loans in the very first place. But secondly, I want to point out a contradiction that comes out of closing government. They said that these loans are often absolute necessities, that's why they ask for them, but somehow they won't take these loans anymore because of these conditions. We think that since they're absolute necessities, we think that they will take them either way, but it is only in our side that we have enough loans or enough money to give loans to all the countries that actually need them. But secondly, I think this means opening opposition because it's a prerequisite to a lot of their benefits such as stabilization, such as long-term economic growth, to be able to get the funding for these loans. And we only guarantee that there is funding for these loans when people are, like the U.S., when institutions like the European Union are willing to fund this thing in the very first place. But before I move on to your opening. If we most bad that the only level of regulation that could get a return on loans is the current one the IMF has, don't Western countries still have independent incentives to compete with China and to get resources from these countries they can get nowhere else? First, they don't want to just extract these economies harmfully because they're already deeply integrated, something that I don't approve. But secondly, and more importantly, I want to make the argument that a lot of these Western liberal democracies or a lot of these Western countries have good incentives, primarily because one, the economy is interdependent, but secondly, more importantly, the reputation and the legitimacy of the IMS relies on the fact that these loads and conditions work. Second argument, why do developing countries are already deeply integrated with Western economies and the IMF conditions ensure that the policy is consistent and effective? What exactly are the conducive conditions of these developing countries? Something all themes in the debate significantly ignore. Three things. A. They suffered persistent inflation, not just only to supply net bottlenecks, but secondly and more importantly, because they overreacted to the COVID-19 pandemic. Even if it is true that government said that a lot of their economists and government regulators had good incentives on their people, that was particularly a problem. They overspent. They overspent on things such as subsidies on food, subsidies on fuel, subsidies on fertilizers, even if there were no goods present in the market, even if there were no supply chains making sure that people could buy these goods in the right first place. That's why the pressure to overspend now, not just structurally, but the massive miscalculation of subsidies and funding resulted in inflation getting worse in a lot of these developing countries. That's why even if you have a lot of funding for your fertilizer, you do not end up enough fertilizer to go around in the market. But secondly, and more importantly, this resulted in a escalation or a race to the bottom of the overheating of the economy, making it significantly worse. Why then do we fix this coming from opposing opposition? We think, one, you reduce uncertainty in the artificial transaction costs of trading with a lot of these developing countries. And this primarily exists because you work on a free market exchange rate. You work on things such as a free market interest rate. That ensures that not only that you reduce uncertainty, as mentioned by deputy of opposition, but you have the same monetary structures, the same monetary policy that's Western countries that are more willing to trade you and more willing to invest with you in the very first place. All for all these reasons and more, the motion falls. Thank you. Countries from the crisis for various reasons, such as 
They can limit the, the, for example, the amount of COVID that they have with zero COVID policy, or generally to limit the output and uh, like people going out, blah, blah, blah. This means that one, even if they're a bit weaker, they still go, give out a lot of loss. You can see this, for example, with Vietnam and other Central Asian countries right now. Why is this the case? Because China always has incentives to make countries on their side of the house. Three reasons. One, they're competing with the US for deals specifically right now when countries are weaker and when they can storm and them into good deals that are good for them, such as to later be able to take their ports, to corrupt their politicians, and to actually make it so that they become allies for them for life. Secondly, though, China actively benefits with this, right? Because you get easier trade, they can uh, put on their BRI, create more infrastructure that they later can take up. I think this is something that they always have to do and always want to do. But lastly, I would say that the um, the competition right now is the following. When IMF has strict rules that you want to follow, countries go to China because they're more lenient and get into the trap of getting fucked over in the future. This is what we want to prevent. Secondly, though, they say that countries generally give reasons as to why the IMF uh, is like, <laughs> I don't know, people don't want to give them money and blah, blah, blah. First, you know, this is a stop to the openings. I think it's uh, inherently yeah, wrong. Both characterization to exist. But secondly, I would say, not that most countries that invest in the IMF do not get into the sense that they will always get their loans back. This can be looked, for example, when countries bailed out Greece and did not want their loans back, specifically because they know that this is something that sometimes happens. But secondly, most countries go into this knowing that there is a risk, right, that they might not be able to pay this off because there are poor countries that anything may happen. I'm unsure why if you don't implement those specific policies that they claim about, you will not want to invest. Because not, if we prove to you that you will be able to substantially deal well with this, I think this is something that you can buy. But thirdly, the whole argument relies on this generally you know, making you better able to repay your loan. However, they never really prove the reasons as to why this makes you economically better. Oh, oh do this. What we need to prove on their side of the house is the following. We say that this, if this is that good in terms of the economy, I think you do the, the, those policies will be done symmetrically. Because you don't want to lower inflation. You don't want to make sure that you're a market competitive. The reason right now, right now where it's conflicting policy is the following. We are in a very weird situation when there's hyperinflation and recession at the same fucking time. And it depends on a country to country basis to regulate those economies in a way that is best for them. Forcing those who support them would make it worse on their side for you to be able to pay your loan back. Because if your economy gets bad, you will not be able to pay it back in that sort of case. Thirdly though, on the way up, I think what we weigh out is the following. Even if some countries pull out, even though they will be heavily scrutinized by their populations that actively support you helping developing countries, even though this actively harms the ability for Western nations to do, take lucrative deals for developing countries and make sure they get oil or other allies in terms of uh, organizations such as the UN, I think this is marginal compared to the side of some developing countries who will be forced to take out the law from bad actors and get into a worse political uh, situation where, first, in the long term, their people and populations are harmed because they cannot receive the benefit of those investments, or second, because generally it makes you allies with countries that want to fuck you up later. Secondly, on OO, oh, take later. I think there are two things on this. First thing, they are correct. OG never proved why you necessarily have the ability you to are. do those, econo their, those economic decisions well in your country. We do this as well. But I think it's very interesting as to what they were because they actively try to prove to you that you have incentives to do bad economic policy, even though they prove, for example, things that you want to win the elections. I'll just put this point. First thing, not that they, generally the, the impacts of you having a bad economy can be felt in the short term as well. This looks like if your country doesn't fix inflation, you can feel literally that your money buys less. You see how the price of the milk where you every day go to the store is going up and it's something that you can rationalize. If they say, and one of the reasons is you want to win elections, I think it's more important for people to see the economic benefits of the investment as opposed to what they say about some jobs being happening, right? Because if you see that your money buys less or you generally are weak economically, this is something that's very important. Secondly, know that the economy of the state is just a very big voting issue and this is because it's very easy to understand it. You do not need a PhD to understand that your country right now is experiencing a recession where you see that country out your shops are empty or because you don't have a job right now. I think it's easy for you to scrutinize the state to the point of which your economy is not good. But thirdly, and I think this is the best reason, I think most of the economic uh, the, and the uh, uh, policies that they're talking about, about overspending cannot always be changed by this motion itself, right? It's, this motion targets more so monetary policy at best, even if they limit of uh, spending. I think what we brought to you about how this is done by technocrats who always have the incentive for this to be done. Well, I think it's more intuitive as to why you're able to do this. In your best case, maybe you have some countries being able to have a bit more growth because the IMF is apparently stupid versus all the other countries like Greece who literally have no money when they're not able to pay because of the de deficit ratio is low. Again, I think what's the problem in their case is that they really give the benefits to what is good for you to do those policies. Like economic investment.
investment, growth of the nation, people having jobs. And I think this is something that you would want on your side of the house, when, for example, your populist can say, look, we gave you new jobs, we gave you, we, uh, made, we make uh, businesses come out of this country, and so on and so forth. But lastly, on business investment, know that they are actively first in line about why you get business investment, because right now developing countries have low interest rates, and that's how they're able to attract businesses. On their side, you increase them so, to deal with inflation, right? This in the long term means you have the worst economics in terms of businesses do not come to your country to provide jobs. Or secondly, if you put or remove the subsidy, it means that your fuel becomes more expensive and less market competitive in the future, fucking up your economy and disallowing you to be more independent. Now, lastly, on our openings. Uh, I'm very happy for uh, OGB, uh, for COB being here because I do, it doesn't mean I have to stop. But they are correct. Pre their principle can be no, not fulfilled by any conditions of the IMF, right? Any condition that the IMF would have is something that infringes on your autonomy to have this law. I think this is something that you should terribly don't care as much. But secondly, I think that the, what the about their practicality is that the big missing thing is they never explain why you domestic, as a domestic country have the ability to make the policy in a good way, thus removing you out of the crisis, which is a critical thing that we bring on their side of the house. But secondly, economic development and the reaction that you have to the crisis is something that is contested by opposition teams. What we prove to you is that once the IMF is less strict with those conditions, you are better able to take those nations in the Western mindset and help them improve, not going into China. Very proud of you. Flop without loans or flop because they don't do the right things with the money? 
One, the integration is more biased towards the Western countries, i.e. like the Western countries don't necessarily rely on the other nations, but the developing nations do rely on these nations. I want to then talk about weighing against opening opposition and why loans are having the capital in the first place is the most important thing in the round. I want to talk about our extension. Closing all government's response to our extension is to say that obviously Western countries don't un understand that they won't always get their money back. And we agree. This is not about profit incentives. In fact, Maddie's mechanisms were not reliant on what the profit incentives of Western countries were. It was reliant on why they are loaning out money in the first place. They do not care about profit. What they are trying to push is the idea ideology between the Bretton Woods institutions. They don't respond to this claim. But that then means that it doesn't matter their response that says, oh, they would lend money anyway because they understand this happens in some instances, obviously they understand that sometimes they lose money. But they want to lose money at a particular benefit, which is to be able to support the kinds of ideologies that they believe in. If you can no longer support those ideologies, it is unlikely that they're going to be giving out the yeah, sure. Second thing I want to do in terms of weighing against opening opposition. I think opening opposition gives you a lot of good reasons to believe that maybe these policies are good. But I do understand that there's a lot of pushback from both governments that says, oh, but in certain instances, these policies are likely to be bad, that different ways, that, that different nations have different ways of developing their economy. I think we agree to some extent. Obviously, there are different ways of developing your economy. Some countries get success by doing things like protectionism, i.e. the Asian tigers. Other countries get more success by doing things like free trade and in integrating yourself into the Western economy. The question, though, is given that there are the, both of these ways of getting economic development require a huge amount of capital injection, especially when your nation is going through an economic crisis, the question of this round is capital. That means that maybe their benefits might be true, but it relies on the fact that countries are willing to give out loans in the first place. The opening government preemption for extension is to say that, oh, but the IMF would lend money anyway because they want to give loans and they still want to trade with these countries. Obviously, the logical conclusion of this argument is that if they want to, to, to like, give loans because they want to continue trading, they want to believe that these developing nations would be successful if you give out the loan. This is the IMF's conception of how your countries are likely to get success, and therefore that means that this is the only way we're able to increase capital. Okay. Finally, I want to deal with opening government. I don't think they have much weight in the round. Opening government talks about two things. The first thing is in terms of the principle. I think my POI already kind of responds to the principle, but more importantly, I would just like to note that their principle is just a pure assertion. There's no actual reason as to why someone who is lending you money doesn't have rights to impose the fact that you want to get your money back to some extent. Secondly, though, I think there are more tangible impacts in the round is in terms of why these are harmful to other nations. First of all, I think their, or their entire argument of both opening government and closing government relies on a faulty, a faulty premise that says if something is good for the West, then by definition it must be bad for developing countries. They don't ever prove why this is true. The meaningful contribution from closing opposition is to explain why given the economy already revolves around the West, things that are good for the West and things that the West are pushing are likely things that are better for developing nations. Secondly, the opening government gives you some responses to say that, oh, but like these, uh, uh, these countries do consider their incentives, or like the IMF has really bad incentives. The opening opposition just asserts that they have good incentive and tells us how they would implement their policies. I think the actual reasonable response to be giving is that these nations don't, often, like, they understand that if these countries were to flop, they would also lose money. So presumably their incentives aren't terrible. Finally, I think the premise of the opening government case is to say that spending more money is always good. But the problem is, is that when you spend more, it is a question of what exactly you are spending on, whether you are able to prop up your economy in the long run, that only happens on our side. At the end of the day, maybe there are multiple ways of getting economic development. The question in this round is, any way of getting economic development relies on the existence of capital. We have much, much more capital to give up to every single developing nation. We are so proud to stand for closing all the